let's welcome the, the panel up. I should say first that we, uh, I think we're the only guys using uh, Slido today. Um, so if you do have access to Slido on your phone, it's very simple, hashtag twin. We're not using it for questions and answers. We would like lots of questions from the audience, um, but we are in the midst of a study at the moment and the Department of Transport would like actually to collect some data. So you'll see underneath the poll section some questions to you really about what you think the benefits and uh, the challenges of developing a national integrated transport operational digital twin might be, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, as I said, welcome. Uh, my name's Ryan Ahood. I'm the digital highways leader at Arup. I'm also a director of the membership organization ITS UK. I will chair this session for the next 30 minutes or so, but perhaps also of relevance is that I'm the Arab sponsor for a piece of work currently underway with the Department for Transport looking at the economic benefits of a multimodal network management digital twin at a national scale. Um, I will introduce again our, our panel. So we have Andy Emmons, Chief Transport Analyst at Transport for London, George Economides, Head of Digital Twins um, at the Department for Transport. We have Miranda Sharp, expert, data guru, and uh, involved in the National Digital Twin Program. We have Ben Ford, Network Rail, and the Digital Twin Hub. And we've got Paul Darlow from Portsmouth City Council and a bit of an ambassador for Digital Twins on the South Coast. Um, um, in terms of format, each of our panelists are going to give around three minutes of their personal perspective. We're going to break into a bit of discussion. We're going to come to you, the audience, for questions. And I believe there's a roaming mic uh, that Paul, if he hasn't disappeared, has. Um, and then we're going to close out with a single point you would like the audience to take away from the conversation or to action with relation to the topic. Now, before I give you the chats to um, give your personal perspective, I just wanted to give, give you a few minutes of, of my own view. Um, some will have heard me say this before, but I think the transport outcomes that we're looking and seeking for in this particular sector are, are a, say, so, you know, they're largely consistent, say, so cleaner, more accessible, lower cost, more efficient, seamlessly integrated, more resilient transport systems. But, in my experience, what I'm really seeing is how people use the network and the technology landscape is drastically changing. And I think that gives us the opportunity to think differently about how we achieve those um, outcomes. Uh, one of those concepts is really the digital twin, and I'm not talking about digital twin for an asset. What I'm seeing emerging is the digital twin concept of massive scale across geographies, so cities, regions, nationally, across modes, land, sea, and air, and across environments, so utilities, energy, telecommunications, and the, the natural environment. And just to give an example of that, uh, which I don't think will get mentioned by the panelists today, um, the Transport for West Midlands Regional Transport Coordination center and the incident management systems, you can see right now that they're harnessing huge amounts of data from local authorities, from transport operators, and also from third parties like Waze, ITO World, and the Environment Agency. And they're really using that to create this single integrated view of what's happening in real time across their transport network, looking for anomalies within that and then actioning that, and it's improving their situational awareness of what's happening across their road network, across their transport network, um, and it's drastically improving their coordination with the local authorities, with the emergency services, uh, and their user base, and you see that in the communication that they're making. From our study so far, I can't go into the details, but you know, we're really seeing quite significant benefits in this space, but the question really I'm asking myself is what is the right level of ambition we should have in this area? What are the basic building blocks uh, we, sh we should undertake? 
And um, uh, with that, I think I'll hand to, I'll go to George first to give a bit of a DFT perspective. George. Thank you very much, Ryan. And thank you everyone for joining. As Ryan said, I'm George Kulmidis. I am the head of Digital Twins for the Department of Transport. Just to give a bit of context, what is a Digital Twin? What do we mean by that? What is the department doing? So Digital Twin is best understood in our view uh, with a definition given by the Department of Business and Trade and Department of Science and Technology. We are all familiar with what a model is. We can capture the data, create a model representing a process and asset storage system, and run that, get insights, and to understand how to best optimize it. But sometimes we need to track what the real world is doing. So we can connect that model to the real world so it follows and gives us the current state of that asset process system. That we call it the shadow. This is the next step after that, where the model can also not only have an input of information, but an output to another model or straight back to the physical world. And that can create federation between different digital twins, increasing the capability, can enable us to do predictive maintenance, what if scenarios, and collaborate through that single point of truth. So back in 2022, the DFT Transport Research Innovation Board considered the value of digital twins and agreed that there is a key potential benefit, especially according to our strategic aims, including decarbonization, improving trust for the user, and a growing a level up the economy. And for that reason, created a roadmap of an vision to 2035 that was launched by the minister back in June to what would a multimodal network, a multimodal digital twin be for transport. And multimodal was crucial because we can all understand the good work done by the different ANTS bodies, by the different local authorities, but it is linking this together to produce greater resilience, greater performance that we see a big benefit or the potential benefit, which is part of the work we're doing with Lion's team. The other thing that happened is my team was established in the department to read the digital twin program. So now we have a five works in program between leadership, looking at the basic building blocks, the network infrastructure, data standards, some key applications that can enable us to learn by doing, but also demonstrate how digital twins can support transport. And on that, we're working very closely with the National Digital Twin Program by the Department of Business and Trade. Also looking at the skills and capabilities and finally engagement. So, so far, we have already seen that there is a growing market that the UK could benefit. We have seen a lot of key use cases from resilience, quick response, better information, targeted information, so it's useful, collaboration between public sector agencies and public sector and the private sector. But we really need to understand from the experts, who are the people sitting with me rather than me, on how can that translate to benefits on the ground. Thank you very much, Ryan. Hopefully that was a good introduction. Pass on to somebody else. Go to Ben next. Thanks. So, um, so thank you. Uh, so I think to me that the purpose of a, you know, a digital twin and operating digital twin has to, has to, be, has to do three things for us uh, in, in the transport world. So I think it's got to be countrywide. Uh, I think it's got to be purpose driven. Uh, and I think it's got to be a self-adjusting system. Those are my three things. So what do I mean then? So countrywide, you know, my auntie needs to be able to tap in at, uh, at her local bus stop uh, on Hailing Island uh, and tap out at the bus stop outside my mother's house uh, just south of Birmingham. And everything in between needs to just work. Uh, and, you know, and she needs to be able to go on whatever buses she happens to want to go on or trains or anything else and just get the bill at the end of the day. And there needs to be some security around what the scale of that bill will be. But that needs to work for the whole country because the system is too complex to work any other way. You can't expect bus drivers to sell tickets to areas far, far outside their experience or knowledge. So it's got to it's be done in the back. It's all got to be automated. It's all got to be countrywide. It's got to be purpose-driven. So it needs to integrate with your life. So when you're sat at work and it's, you're planning to get home, you know, nip, or, nip, nip out as quickly as you can at the end to get home to watch the rugby in the pub with your friends and, and the rail network's gone wrong, God forbid, or, or more likely the, the road network, uh, uh, some, something's happened. So what, you know, what, what are you going to do? When you, your, your, your iPhone, your smart device should know, should know this before you even do. And, that, and you should never have to worry about it because it will go, oh, okay, that's gone wrong. Here's some options. It, and those options should be fed by an understanding of the system and understand what you're trying to achieve. And it'll say to you, well, you can go this way, you can go that way, or you can go to the pub um, and watch it in this pub with these people 
connects up to your social media, connects up to your work accounts, understands all those things and figures out actually, here's some good options, here's some other things you might try that meet your purpose, that serve you. So the more we can integrate it with that stuff, the better it's going to be, the more it's going to add value to human beings and human life. Um, and it needs to be connected to a self-adjusting system because if it's all just on the just on the user side, that's one thing. But actually, if you're um, if you're connecting to dead data, that's a problem. If you're optimizing for individuals, that's a problem. It needs to optimize for the whole system for all the people all the time. So we then need a, a model of the move, a model, a real-time digital twin model of the movement of individual journeys. You know, if Ocado can track um, the movement of every single you know bunch of bananas that it moves in the UK in real time, which it does quite effectively. That's, that's no more complex in numerical terms than us tracking the movement of one of the people that move in the railway all the time. It's eminently doable. There's no reason technologically why we can't do it. Um, so the barriers really are, you know, are, are getting people to think that it's the whole thing. You know, it's the whole thing. It's not, it's all the people all the time. It's not just individuals. Um, and so we need that digital twin ecosystem. Um, the challenges in the public sector and around in particular and in the current economic climate and everything that's going on it needs a real clear directive from government because otherwise it's just not going to happen because there's too many, there are too many pressures to not do these things, to not invest in these things, and to not make the progress that we need to make. Um, I refer you to a lot of stuff Andy Burnham was saying last night. He was absolutely bang on the money, in my view, with a lot of things he said. Rail needs to seriously you know, think about where it is and where it wants to be and understand how fast the changes are happening in the transport sector more broadly. Andy. Hi. Um, I'm Andy Evans and I work at Transport. Sorry. I work at Transport for London and I look after the roads data. And I have the good fortune in that I take that data from all sorts of sensors, often in real time. I platform that and I transform that into business intelligence. And I was given the challenge as part of our uh, infra infrastructure change technology systems project that we are developing of how do I deliver change within that organization? London has uh, six billion pounds worth of congestion per annum. So how do I bring that data to bear in basically solve the problems that the challenge was being set to me, having one version of the truth, turning that data into intelligence in real time that actually can really improve the management of the road network. And so I brought that experience to bear and I am a practitioner, an advanced practitioner of building a real-time digital twin. So I have done that. I basically um, have brought my experience to bear to the stage where we've moved beyond the proof of concept to putting a digital twin into production and developed around that a minimum viable product, which is basically around instant detection. So the business case for the SITS program was how do I influence that congestion? What's the biggest influence I can have? And the idea is that it's around instant detection. Normally, it would take about 15 to 17 minutes for a normal control room to detect an instant. If I can do that digitally using real-time data and I can get a response from the control room back, you know, in a mirror, back to the network um, in a fraction of that time, then I can substantially save a lot of that um, congestion burden. In fact, the, the business case says that in completion of our project, um, we will be saving out of that six billion pounds a year, about a billion pounds a year, um, between 28 and to sort of 35. And about half of that will come because of better instant detection. And about half of that will become because we have basically enabled better journey times for everybody and we can deliver that. So I'm bringing a lot of experience to bear and um, hopefully I can share that on this platform. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Paul Dahl, I'm the Traffic and Network Manager at Portsmouth. Um, and one of the applications we've actually um, built is a digital twin of ferry movements between Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight across the Solent. Um, and that's car ferries, passenger ferries, and you know, hovercraft too, which is pretty unique. Um, and what we've used is the marine AIS data, um, and we've receiving that data live from the vessels. Um, we actually then track that information about how many crossings an hour are being made by those different vessels and comparing that against the timetable. When we then start to see that there's a, a degradation of service against the timetable, that can then raise an alert. And you might be thinking, 
well, as traffic and network manager, why the hell are you interested in what's going on at the sea? In sea? Actually, particularly for the car ferry, if there is a disruption to service and ferries aren't sailing, well, very quickly, a queue starts to form on the road network. And in the first couple of hundred meters, everyone in that queue is trying to get onto the ferry. When we get back a kilometer from that, there's probably 10% of people are trying to get on the ferry. When we get back up onto the motorway and onto the strategic road network, probably less than 1% of people are trying to get on the ferry. But all of that congestion and disruption has been triggered by a failure of the vessels to sail and a loss of capacity. So the earlier that we can detect that, the earlier that we can have a conversation um, with the operator and say, what's going on? Is this a little blip? Or is this going to be an outage of a vessel the rest of the day? We can then understand, you know, together and do a joint working about messaging their customers, messaging the general public that there is things going on. And if necessary, get out into the road network and intervene if we need to, um, to nip it in the bud early. And we can do that, you know, we're catching that in real time and that alerting um, just by tracking digitally what is going on in real time. Um, and that's one of the digital twins, you know, and the benefits we can get um, from, from, from digital tracking of vessels, which effectively is a digital twin. Now, we're not capturing everything about the vessel. We're not capturing how many people are on board. You could go into the nth degree about a digital twin, about all the intricacies that you might, might collect or capture and hold. We're only capturing the pertinent information that we need so you can build it relatively cheaply, relatively quickly to get something that gives a solution to a problem. Thank you, Miranda. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm really excited listening to these real examples of people sharing real data to solve real problems. They're, they're not just creating single digital twins of single assets. They're sharing data between assets, between asset classes on different, on different time series to, to really solve problems. And for me, that's the most important thing about digital twin is, it, is that it solves a real problem and it has data sharing, it has data partnerships, that's its clear. Um, and, um, and for me, there's a, there's a maturity that we need to go on, on sort of three dimensions. We need to be clear when we're creating these twins, when we're sharing data, what we're sharing, because it isn't just the data, it's information about the data that might be just as important, so we're sharing the right kind of stuff. Um, we need to be clear on who we're sharing it with. Um, many of you will know about the National Underground Asset Register, which is a brilliant thing, which is to keep people safe at work. Um, uh, so it's about underground assets so that when you dig a hole you don't go through a cable and kill everybody brilliant and um, there are of course security implications to sharing that information and so we need to be super clear on who we're sharing it with rather than just publishing open data and hoping that brilliant innovators are going to do fantastic things and finally and for me most intriguingly is um, how do we generate and engineer a fair value exchange um, because so often the people that need to invest in information and data to make it accessible, to make it useful to other people, are not the same people who are going to benefit from it. Um, and there needs to be a piece of infrastructure in the middle there um, that enables us all to benefit from shared data so that we're not creating our own data, storing our own data and putting it in, in, in heat generating e uh, data, data warehouses. We're sharing common data so that we can join up, join up and, and reach common goods together. Uh, thank you, Miranda. Any questions? Well, I'll go first, but if there, if there are any questions, um, I'm going to pick on you first, Paul, and maybe we'll pick that up. Uh, you know, people tend to think of this thing as a, a huge monolithic digital, you know, single integrated digital twin of, of, of the national network, but I know you're a, a keen advocate of much more practical steps. Can you just talk a bit more about that? What you think we should be doing? Yeah, absolutely. I think you need to have regard to the national framework and the bigger picture. So that's the first thing is to almost set your scene, understand what's going on and what the standards and, and things like security and all those things, you need to have regard to that. That shouldn't be a barrier for you to actually to get on and do something. And we're very much an authority that will take a stickle brick, take a piece of Lego, take a piece of Meccano and fuse them together, a um, bit cheap and cheerful to get something to work you can always productionize it later, but actually you can prove the concept very cheaply, very quickly. You know, and, I, and if, I, if I'm honest, our digital twin for the Isle of Wight ferries was delivered within two months and cost less than £10,000, you know, to get something up and working that gives us an outcome and a solution to what we need. Now you can build on that, 
but we can get something that delivers straight away or very quickly. And that gives you confidence and enthusiasm to carry on and start looking at other things like digital twins of traffic signals and all sorts of other things. But get some quick wins and some successes, and then you've got something to show people, something to talk about, and also to encourage yourself, give yourself a pat on the back that you've achieved something. Does anybody want to build on that? I, I, no, I, I would absolutely and wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, the more time we spend in a dark room talking about data standards, you know, the fewer deliveries we're going to make. Um, and and you know, the, the, I, I would argue that the data standards are important. Um, and I, I say that in case Dan Ross is listening to me somewhere. Um, we, we, need to be, we need to engineer the transaction and the sharing of value first. Um, because we can we can have marvelous data standards, and the risk is nobody will apply, nobody will apply them anyway. Thank you, Andy. Building blocks. Can you just talk through some of the building blocks for TFL? Um, yeah. So one of the big building blocks is um, basically geospatial awareness, and um, all of the the data that you bring together, which gives you context about your. Um, road space. So the starting point is an awareness of that. Um, and as I went through the problems, uh, essentially I looked at it strategically and basically asked the question, what do I need to achieve one version of the truth? What do I need to provide information that's valuable to customers, but also something that can deliver in real time? So I, I basically spent a lot of time thinking about how to bring together all those elements. And they basically led me to some number of conclusions, you know. One is, is that to solve the policy agnostic and solve problems of the future, I needed really granular data. So I decided I'm going to take a, a build bottom-up approach, build data from the bottom, but aligned with the business requirements. So understanding the business is key. Um, but then the question is, what is the data that I need that is the right geographical space to answer that question? Then I understood that actually to answer questions, you often need to bring data together. You need to bring journey time data and flow data together, and you need to align data in space and time. So that led me to the development of a framework, which was almost like the second layer of the, um, uh, of the prototype digital twin. And then there was the bit that was, well, what does the mirroring, and what also delivers it in real time, and also what actually provides information in a way that's customer useful, and that was like, Ah, a graph database does that, you know. So I basically partnered up with Neo4j and basically used that graph database to align with that. And then you get on to the consumption end. You've got to make this information useful to the consumer. You've got lots and lots of what I call space dust, really, really detailed space dust. Think about the person in the control room that has to consume that, you know. And that led to a visual layer. And then the, 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 the top part of that was actually thinking through how do I you know, compartmentalize doing the computing power, having a version of the digital twin, you know, the situational awareness, but I ask it to do lots of different things. And then I thought, well, let's modularize it. Let's have a module for situational awareness and maybe one that tells us about you know, the emissions from vehicles. And that basically, basically was the building blocks of the digital twin. There was a lot of top to bottom strategic thinking of all those elements, but once you've done that, um, I'm a bit like my colleague. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of money on it. Uh, we got free support from Neo4j to actually help uh, as achieve what we wanted to do. And we just went ahead and we just built and um, out of that, you know, success. And uh, as long as you have that strategic thinking about, does it fit your customer? Is it going to deliver the other end? Is it going to do all those bits? So you've got to do a fair bit of strategic thinking in that pot, but it's all doable. And that's contributing to a billion pounds annually in benefit. That's correct, yeah. So that's, that's what's going to be the end point. Um, you know, instant detection is one thing, but essentially uh, building on, uh, bringing all this data together, we can uh, bring that data over to the control room for situational awareness. We can take that over into a predictive module. We've got lots of things that we want to do with this data, but be focused in your first view. It, you know, you, you've done the bit about the ferries. My first view was instant detection. There's lots of directions this could evolve in, but actually be very focused on what you want to do as your first view of data. Any other thoughts on building blocks? I just wanted to reiterate really something that every panelist has said, that we have to start with the value. Having a clear use case, because digital twins can go from strategic 
to R&D use cases, to infrastructure, and there's a lot of good work been happening in the BIM space. But what we have found through a lot of conversation is that live coordination, what Andy said about alignment in space, time, a common understanding that can create the added value between stakeholders that are already realizing the internal value. So the question for us sometimes, what are the missing elements for the next step? And that's where we're working with the National Digital Twin Program and the demonstrators to see how we can also link with other sectors because energy, housing, healthcare are also undertaking the data saying architecture and digital twin um, journey. And transport is very important to be part of that as the key or way to connect people and assets in fact, together throughout the country and externally. Ben? Yeah, well, it's the, um, for me, the, the barriers in technological, the barriers managerial, and, and I would like what you're saying about it, it's the value, value chain is a key part of it, uh, and the management science is a key part of it, because that's, if we ha it's, it's how do we create the market, to, have we have the market in, infrastructure to allow people to transact, so, so you can have a building block, if you can have a building block, actually you can see why it's worth the effort of plugging them together, and we can make it easier for them to plug together. Um, and whether that's the, yeah, and a lot of that is about management science, about value sharing, about actually, you know, who can I trust, how far can I trust them um, to make it easy for me to collaborate with a variety of different partners very quickly and efficiently. Um, well, that was pretty <laughs> quick. I think we're, we're just about out of time. Um, I've got two, two fulfilling <laughs> questions. Um, so one of them is about what the, well, we've got a question here. Do you want to just shout? It's only to stop progressing, uh, Billy. You're talking about what you know, national things where it's a transport break this way. We won't have how we do this. You can't. What? Okay. All you can. I'm sure it. They would say it all as a NFT. Oh. Do you want me to do that again? Shall I just repeat that? Who owns it? Ultimately, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think interoperability issues that that will overlay all of the issues that you've touched on. Um, Do you want to pick it up? I try to pick it up. It's a great question. George, yeah. you know, oh, I this. can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So, just to repeat your question, is we're talking about a multimodal, connected, operational, national transport digital twin. And because that was rogue enough, we didn't want to add federated, because that is the uh, which is the idea that each agency, whether that is TFR, which Portman, which network layer, we already have experts that are managing this network. And how do we enable them to collaborate better with each other, with other sectors, including the private sector, and respond both to predictable, unpredictable events and the business user? Any further comments? Who does that in it? I think I've already done it. Oh, okay. um, that, that, you see. I think the answer is it's emergent. Yeah, he is emergent. Well, I think I think that's an interesting point around the um, around the the human journey element, though, because there, there's the one layer that everybody needs, which is the human journey element. And does that does that need to be a publicly owned asset? Does that need to be held in trust for a bunch of different people? I don't know. There's that, that the rest of it you can federate, but there's some bits that need to be owned by everyone and no one. It, well, there, there, there used to be an appropriate value exchange to support the continued use. Um, uh, and that's a missing piece of infrastructure that has had precious nickel uh, consideration up till now, um, and, and which is why we need to do some of the small stuff so we experiment and find the different models, uh, because only through experimentation are we likely to get close to the right one. Uh, and if I just say as well, um, try and reuse what there is already there. I think we, you could easily go down a rabbit hole of reinventing new data formats, data standards. But for us, like the marine data, AIS is a standard format worldwide. So to take that, you know, it makes it really easy to be interoperable with other things because you're not reinventing the wheel for that. There will be other areas which will be new and emerging data sets where there will be discussion about standards and about formats and but actually you can get underway with some of the existing stuff, you know, and actually what we've done in Portsmouth, you know, you could easily pick that up and translate to any port city in the world by using existing data standards. Just glad that a lot of this will depend on private data to as well, with individual private companies. That's absolutely fine. It's enabling that collaboration. And 
back to Paul's point about research and the mandate and you know, said it, it's something we are also exploring a lot with EPSRC. So EPSRC recognized the potential value in decarbonizing transport and dedicated up to 20 million for a research hub of its the twinning for decarbonizing transport. So we're working with them to understand what are the critical building blocks. Two final questions from me. Fast forward a year, we're back here, we're talking to the same audience. What will have changed? First point. Second point, um, what single takeaway would you give to the audience from this conversation or more broadly with your interactions with uh, digital twins? Andy. Um, I'd, I'd like to be able to think I can bring back uh, a demonstrator for you. And, uh, you know, as we've got production, it would be great to put it up on the screen and actually show you what it looks like and, and how it's delivering. If I was to give a single um, piece of advice from my experience, um, I hear a lot of people talking about ontologies. I hear people talking about a lot about the technology stacks, et cetera, that you would use. But I think the starting point for me is also bringing geospatial awareness to the problem. There isn't a lot of that in the literature. There isn't a lot of that in, 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 in the thought processes of, of my normal discussions with people, but it's key because essentially that's how we scale and that's how we actually um, understand different problems. And it leads in directly to the discussion we're having here about how do we ultimately federate that? You know, I have a view that I've built a framework that is one that will actually deal with 90% of the problem. So that doesn't mean that I can't drill down at a different, different spatial scale or drill up to a more strategic scale. And I think that some of that thinking is about how we're going to do federation successfully. So um, just have a geospatial awareness. I'm going to go to you, Paul, and then work back to George. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from, from our point of view, um, I mean, the key part of my role is the expeditious movement of traffic as defined by the Traffic Management Act. So I'm always looking at what are the threats to free moving of traffic in our city. So as I said, ferry congestion, certainly, or you know, congestion around ferries is one of them, but there's lots of other things that, you know, if we're looking at creating a digital model, you can start to see things that go outside of tolerance and say, mm -hmm. it, well, this thing operates within these tolerances day in, day out, but now it's way outside that. That might be in need of a bit of attention and almost like a warning and informing dashboard alert system that can say to us as a network management team, there's something here that's a bit out of the ordinary. You probably need to get some eyes on or understand what's going on here um, and delve a little deeper. Um, focus on this because this might turn into a big incident. Um, I think there's a question about how good is good enough. You can do some stuff and get some really good results and it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, there are some key things, accuracy and reliability of data and latency. It's no good if you're getting information in real time and it's an hour out of date. So you need to look at those. But actually for things like tracking ferries, I don't need it to be sub-second. If I'm looking at traffic signals, Absolutely, I do. So it's about understanding and applying the relevant, you know, um, quality standards to what you're trying to achieve. Look at your problem and then identify the right solution and invest accordingly. I thought you were going to say bin lorries, but you're almost got there. We'll come back to that. Ben. So I'll ask the questions the other way around. So I think the, the, the key takeaway for me is, you know, you look at, we, we, we need digital twin ecosystem. We need, we need to create the market infrastructure to support that ecosystem. Um, the technical barriers are not the problem. Um, there are technical barriers in terms of both quality. There are, but the, the, they're not. They're not technologically difficult. They're mainly just organised side so self and blinking. We'll go on with it. Um, so the challenge really is around the management science, uh, around the management understanding, around getting leadership teams to understand and value this stuff uh, to create efficient ways for people to collaborate, efficient for the market to work, so that small companies can, can collaborate with big companies and with other small companies um, and do that efficiently and effectively. And a key challenge there is around standards and interoperation. So, because you know, can we expect relatively small companies to have uh, all the cyber security standards, all the quality management standards, all that stuff in place that feels feel secure working with them all the time? Well, no, it, it's just not reasonable. The number of standards they would have to comply with would be enormous. Um, actually, only certain different bits of equal. Um, so we need, we need, in my view, a capability maturity model um, in order to allow people to collaborate more efficiently and manage risk more efficiently and effectively. Um, with, with other partners and decide what was to accept, what was to mitigate, um, so that we can have that a more, a more functional market. And there's other bits of market structure, that's the bit I see as 
really important right now. Um, so the thing I hope will change is we'll have that because I think I think we can have that inside a year. Um, in a mid point, it'll still need further validation, but it'll be at a point where it's usable uh, by people to in, in anger to, to try and talk to each other and work together more efficiently. Single poly, Miranda. Um, I really hope that this, in, in a year's time, people are saying, I really want to share my data for this purpose. Tell me how to do it. Rather than us talking about um, real time or 3D and saying, this is going to solve all your problems. George. Based on that, I'm hoping in a year's time, there will be more collaboration, more practical examples. I'm looking forward to seeing more examples from people in this panel and others. And one point going away, there has been the triple roadmap for digital twins to 2035 that has been published and hopefully we will see more traction towards that. Uh, you stole my, my final point, which was the promo for the, for the, for the, um, the DFT Transport Research Innovation Board Digital Twin Roadmap to 2035. So you'll find that online if you want to go and see it. Um, there is, uh, I think, in a month's time, if you're interested in this subject area, there is a there's a one day conference on it, uh, hosted by is it two days, hosted by CPC, the Connected Places Catapult, and the Digital Twin Hub. And uh, I guess something close to my heart and something Arab is involved with overseas is this concept of integrated corridor management. How do you get multi-agency, multimodal, optimized transport networks, which is a real big thing in the States, huge investment, benefit to cost ratios of 10 to 20 to one. That's, I'd like to see that where rail is working with road, with the ferries and so on. That's, um, if you're very interested in that subject, there's loads of information on it. Just go and, go and search it up. My thanks finally to the panel. Uh, round of applause, please. What did it?